good. That's good. Thank you. Um, so um, anyway, you know, I like to talk a little bit about the premise of why Bob actually started this action a little bit and then go to some of the boys, uh, including Espandio, mainly because I had the good fortune of you know, being with him for many, many years since I remember. Um, and then later, you know, I had the fortune of basically being able to translate for him. And this wasn't my choice, actually. I think he kind of selected that. And I heard that later, that he selected uh, his translator, basically. And I, uh, anyway, uh, it, it was a, a golden opportunity for you know, especially me and many, many who came to his talks because uh, it was really uh, intoxicating. I mean, it was to, to the extent intoxicating that I would sometimes lose myself in being sitting there and uh, not being even aware of what is going on around me. And sometimes I would lose myself in those thoughts that I wasn't, wasn't able to translate. So I would walk away, I and mean, a few times I actually had to walk away because I was in chaos, um, you know, in tears. Uh, I couldn't express uh, what he was saying, telling me because uh, first I had to digest it myself to be able to convey that message. Um, with that said, the subject is love. Um, and uh, that's the love that we all are searching, we all have it actually, but uh, the problem is that uh, we have to purify this love. It's, uh, um, the seed is planted, so we have to basically try to take care of it, to germinate it. And how Baba explained to the Permashan boys, which I think it was really wonderful the way he conveyed that message that comes through that time to us. Um, he took that phase of life of working with the Pramashram to say that it can be done. And the way that he kind of got the Pramashram boys going was, uh, you know, discoursing them every night almost. Uh, the boys would come and sit around Baba, and then Baba would discourse <coughs> on different uh, spiritual subjects, uh, including God Speaks that a lot of you have read, and the discourses and all that. And uh, also there is, I guess, the, the new discourses are coming out that, uh, you, you know, especially, especially discourse the boys is coming. That's what I heard. that. Uh, it's called Tiffin Talks, I think. Yeah, it's out. Yeah, Tiffin Lectures. It's out. They've already done it. Yeah, they're out. They're already out. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah, they're expensive. I haven't <laughs> seen them right now. They're in the library. Um, yeah, they're right here. Uh, let's see. Um, so the way Baba was, and I want to create that for myself and maybe uh, mo most of us, to see how you know Baba created that atmosphere for the boys um, to get engaged and express uh, and open their heart, basically. Um, he started the school like a high school and um, Babajan High School, and then also uh, the Mayor Ashram. It was originally the Mayor Ashram and then the high school, and. Uh, he sent circulars through different magazines to all over the world yeah. to accept the students you know, coming um, to the to the ashram. Um, that circular was in one of the local magazines called Hablor Matin, in, uh, in which was distributed. I guess it was printed in Calcutta, in, in uh, Pakistan, and then would go to uh, to Iran also. And a lot of those boys or their parents read about this and they started thinking about sending their boys to this boarding school because, you know, it was 
mainly the boys from Diaz, who is a small village. The people are all farmers mainly, or they have a few cows or cows. They're not very rich. They live in muddy homes, like India basically, very poor. And uh, the father couldn't basically pay for education at all. Uh, now how even paying for growing them up was another mm -hmm. difficulty too. And uh, so anyway, 14 of these boys get together, uh, or Baidullah kind of helps them because Baidullah was the you know, original uh, uh, Mandali who Baba had him, did him for a while in Manzal Amin in that time, and then he sent him back to Iran to live there, and he was a teacher in Iran. And then uh, Baba sends, you know, pencils sometimes, sometimes, you know, booklets to, through battle to some of these kids that later they said they, they got those and they remembered that Bail gave it to them because Baba had sent it for them. Uh, one of them was a Svandiyar. Um, there was another fellow um, named Hassan Mirab, who was a Muslim. There were two Muslims and 12 Zoroastrians. Uh, now the other Muslim, I don't know, Alaba wasn't one of them. Although he was in the ashram, he came, his uncle had a business in Bombay, so he came through his uncle to, uh, to, uh, to see Baba. Because there were a lot of Iranians also living in India at the time. So Baba had sent this circular out or, you know, through local magazines and a lot of these um, fellows from Bombay <coughs> also came to, 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 to be in that school, which one of them was uh, that uh, Sayyid Ali, you know, who you hear about him, was a, had a fiery love for Baba. Another one was Ali, who had a fiery love for Baba also. Um, then. Chota Baba Abdullah Pakravan also hears about uh, about this school, but he was an older one, older person, 16 year old, but he was also, a, a, you know, he had lost his parents, he didn't have enough money for education, he was working a little bit here and there, and then he sees this article about, you know, Baba Jan High School. He said, oh, great, I, you know, I'll go to India and study there and become a doctor. And he was very interested in studying. So he comes there. I'm just setting up the stage to see how these kids come to see Baba. And then Baba, through his, you know, talks and his presence, I mean, presence of the avatar, that's not a joke. Um, <laughs> Being in his presence, the kid got intoxicated by itself. Mm -hmm. And then he's talking all that, and one day Baba says, I make gold out of you if you, know, you listen to me, to what I say. So um, I'm talking about Abdullah now. Abdullah was sitting there, and, and uh, he didn't know anything about the spirituality. Um, when Baba says, I make gold out of you, and um, you know, since that stage for him, he says, after two sessions, I lost consciousness. I, at his presence, I lost my consciousness. I didn't see anything. I wasn't, I didn't know where I am. The only thing I would see was God. And I was totally gone. And I would see Baba in everything and everywhere. And uh, he uh, stays with Baba. Um, and then, he, I, you know, I'm not going to go to his story um, because the book of Pranashram is coming out soon, so you can read about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, wanted to kind of give you uh, a gist of, you know, what was going on in that in that time. Now, um, for Esfandiar was a little different. You know, one day he was in, in his classroom um, and uh, Kekhos Rafsari, who was um, also known as Raul Saheb, was his teacher. 
And one day uh, in the classroom, he recites this couplet of Saadi, you know, that uh, man will get to a point that will not see anything except God. And see, so see how high the abode of human being is. This is the couplet that he, he said. And Asfandel also, his you know, intention was to go there, study, become an engineer. His father was a farmer didn't have a whole lot of money. He knew about Baba for, from childhood through Baidu, who was uh, actually his mother's uncle. Um, yeah, and then um, he goes, you know, and then uh, and he's with Baba and that couplet is read to him. He says, well, if that's the whole purpose of creation, I mean, that's the whole purpose of, you know, one has having human body, uh, to realize God, to see God, then what, what am I doing here? Why, why I should become, you know, become educated and become a doctor or an engineer, get married, have kids, and then die and leave everything behind? What's the purpose of all that? So he starts asking more questions from uh, from Rav Sahib, Kehosu. And Kehosu, tells him, yeah, you know, that whole creation has come to existence for the humanity, for the soul to go through this journey and become one with God. And from then on, he just sets aside all the books and basically gazes into the sky. As a kid of 13 years old at the time, he didn't know where God is, how God is, but his only desire became to see God and realize God. And as he was sitting in the classroom <coughs> for days and days and not paying attention to Kehosur anymore, thinking about God, Kehosur reports, because they had to report everything to Baba, what the classes are, how the classes are going, how the kids are doing, everything was reported to Baba. So uh, Kehosur had reported that to Baba, and one day, the Sander said, you know, I was in my thoughts, and suddenly I looked, and I saw Kehosu, who was in front of me, got up and bowed down. And I looked back and I saw Baba standing right behind me. <laughs> so Baba held me, you know, tight. And then he asked me, why don't you study? And went through you know, a lot of questions until I said, oh, I want to see God. And then, you know, it's a long story. I'm just trying to give you the gist of it, because David didn't give me a whole lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I, handle, I handle blame well. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, he, uh, Baba embraces him and then uh, takes him, uh, after questioning him a lot of time, uh, then the assigned says, I want to see God, that's why I don't want to study, I don't, you know, I want to see God. So uh, Baba takes him to his office from that the Ramsala was their school, the lower Merabad, that the Ramsala was their uh, school. So he takes him to that bathroom, which is now the bathroom next to the Ramsala, if you've been there. That was Baba's office, actually. And then uh, Baba covers himself in a sheet. The Svander is lying down for that period of time, and then Baba gets up and says, follow me. The Svander follows Baba to the back door. There is the chariot, you know, this rickshaw in the, in the, oh, yeah. in the uh, museum right now. But he's standing there with a couple of mandalas holding, holding the handles. And then Baba gets up on the, gets up on the rickshaw and tells the Svander, come up. So he goes up, stands right next to Baba, and if you see that rickshaw, it's actually not as big as this chair, and that's it, you know. Uh, there is no room. So he stands there, and the mandalas start pulling, pulling the rickshaw up the hill from where the railroad, you know, the railroad track is. I mean, you don't go from the footpath, from the car path. That's where they were going, so they, the long way, basically. And then the road was bumpy, you know going here and there, and then the Svander is about to fall, that Baba just says that, hold on to my, you know, mm. to arm. 
That was in 1927, so it was after Baba's silence. Baba had kept silence for two years now. And uh, as a Spaniard is holding to Baba's hand, they reach up on Upper Mirabad, and then uh, Svandar, Baba tells the Svandar to get up, he gets up, <laughs> and then Baba gets up, and then Baba gestures to Svandar and says, did you see how bumpy the road was? The Svandar says, yes, Baba. He says, if you hadn't held on to me, what would have happened? And he says, Baba, I would have fallen off. And then uh, uh, Baba says, <coughs> The spiritual path is exactly the same way. If you don't hold on to me, your master, you will fall off. So from now on, I show you God, but from now on, whatever I tell you, you have to obey. And then he tells him to keep silence. So he can you know, keep silence from then on. And then he also says, uh, these are for all of us. It's not just for him. The reason I set this stage was to convey this message of Baba to all of us that how we can be a Premashram boy mm -hmm. or a girl. Mm -hmm. And that is how he wanted us to do. Now the silence might not be practical in the, you know, in the, the world that we are living in right now, too, too busy maybe with life and, you know, um, wife and children and all that, but if you have the time, if you can do it, that's far better. So he says, keep silence, and from now on, repeat my name continuously. When you feel hungry, you go eat. When you, when you feel you're sleepy, go sleep. But think of me, try to think of me constantly. Image me within your third eye. Now, this was the beginning. He said, yeah, within the third eye. You image me there, and you think of me. And if you, if the, if a word escapes your mouth, you report it to Sidhu, another mandali there, and he will bring you to me. So, as Svander said, my work has started. That was the work of love, you know, I was repeating his name, try to remember him constantly. Sometimes the word would get off my mouth, I would say, hi, Dai, you know, Beidou was his uncle, um, mother's uncle, so I would say, Dai, Dai means uncle in Persian. And um, unintentionally, but it would, you know, if you would see him in the morning, you would say, good morning, Dai, and then Sidhu would take him to Baba. So Baba, at his presence, Baba would say, okay, speak now, whatever you want to say, say it now. And then he would say, Baba, I don't have anything to say. But so he would sit in Baba's presence for a while and then Baba would send him back. Mm -hmm. So that was his work. It started, it started. And one night, Baba explains, now these are the pitfalls of the path. He said, if you don't hold on to me, you will fall off. And this is another pitfall that he, Baba talks about at that night. He says that Chota Baba, who was now unconscious of this world, had gained the you know, hierarchy of six plane of consciousness, Baba said. But he was unconscious at that time. And Baba said, Chota Baba was on the third plane of consciousness in his, in his previous life. In his previous life. And being on the third plane of consciousness, a time will come that the intensity of that pure love, pure love, now we are talking about pure love. That intensity of that pure love is so much that the body cannot bear that love. It's so much that the body cannot hold it, cannot take it, and the heart stops. Mm -hmm. So he, being on the third plane of consciousness in his previous life, got to that point that he was so intoxicated, the bliss took him over. <laughs> And he, his heart was stopped, he got an attack and died. When he died in that present, previous life, he came in this life as Chota Baba. So he said, Baba is telling that to the kids. As father, the next day, he says, I was sitting in his remembrance. And you know, the meditation that they were doing wasn't meditation of the, of the mind. It was the meditation of the heart. 
And he says, I was sitting in his remembrance and the bliss of that remembrance, that love, the bliss is the byproduct of, of, of that love basically. And he said it became so much that I suddenly remember and I felt that, you know, I'm going to lose my body. I remembered what Baba said the previous night about Chota Baba. So I came out of that. I just, you know, forced myself to come out of that and I went for a walk. And then, you know, I cooled off and then came back again and that didn't come back again to me, you know. So basically it passed that pitfall, that space. Mm -hmm. Now one thing Judy one night read and I'd like to share with you is such a wonderful thing. I think it's, a, it's about the meditation of the heart. And I kept that for today. The meditation of the heart, and that, that is what Baba talks about in Discourses, 7th edition, page 232. Complete identification of the master with the spiritual ideal is responsible for removing such, such barriers as might exist between the aspirant and the master. Complete identification of the master with the spiritual ideal is responsible for removing such barriers as might exist between the aspirant and the master. This gives rise to the release of unrestrained love for the master and leads to the meditation of the heart, which consists in constant thinking about the master and with an with an uninterrupted flow of limitless love. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened in Pranashtra. Mm -hmm. So this gives rise to the release of unrestrained love for the Master and leads to the meditation of the heart, which consists in constant thinking about the Master with an uninterrupted flow of limitless love. Such love, such love, that's the purity of that love, that annihilates the illusion of separateness, which seems to divide the aspirant from the master. And it has in it a spontaneity that is virtually without parallel in other forms of meditation. In its final stages, meditation of the heart is accompanied by unbounded joy and utter forgetfulness of the self. And that leads union, union with the beloved. I think this week actually I wanted to share this with you. It, it, it kind of started all with the cremation being on the air. I go to work this Monday and I get an email from Boss Connor um, about a link to a standard 1963 wow. visit to Baba from Lord Mayor. So he sent that to me, he said, Varshid, I think you might have read this before, but here is a <laughs> here is you know what, what I I what I want to share with you. So I read that, I was overjoyed with you know, the remembrance of those times. And then my son, the next day, Tuesday, I think, he sends me a video clip <laughs> of, of uh, the talk that happened in India in, in 1990 when I went to visit Spandor for the first time after I had left Iran. And he gave a talk about uh, a spiritual path and his, you know, his uh, relation with Baba. Um, and that video clip came through and somebody had asked him, is this your dad, you know, translating? <laughs> and he sent it to me to ask that, but I was going to say, surely to do that, you know, that the translation <coughs> was on the air. And then I was working on translating Kashul uh, Hawaii, which is a, a small pamphlet or book written by Kehosra Afsari, the, the school teacher, 
uh, was presented to Baba in 1929, actually. And um, that is the account of the Premashram, mostly the Iranian boys in the Ashram. And that was the translation finished this week, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to share maybe a few, do we have time? A few paragraphs of that, and then we're going to open it to questions if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to give you a gist of you know what is going on over there also. In brief, I'm just reading from portion of it. I mean, it's about 80 pages, but I'm just you know, reading a portion of it. So you can kind of get a feeling of you know what was going on in the permission. In brief, uh, when a kid was admitted to the dormitory, uh, would be given an, a tin chest with three sets of clothing, two handkerchiefs, one set of bedding, one towel, one hat, one pair of shoes, one plate, and one glass. And in the rainy season, umbrella or other, other needed items were given to the students for free. There was also num numbers associated to each student and their belongings. So there, there was order to the belongings and no one else could claim them except the right person. Then the school program and the rules of the school being disclosed to the student and discussed with the student. After that, the student would get registered in the boarding school and he would take some tests to verify their rank in the school and in their classes. So this is the you know, ordinary school because the Premashram did not start until Asfandir was taken up the hill and he was the only and first Premashram boy at the time. And then other boys, you know, came or, you know, got interested and came, came and joined. The necessary books and other educational necessities would be given to the the students for uh, free of charge. In addition to this, the school was equipped with a pharmacy and a doctor who would visit the students who were sick. And often in Merwaba's presence, the students were visited and were given the right medication. For the students' information and experience, there was also a library in the school which had every kind of books on spirituality, religion, life stories of poets and histories about the great ones. Sometimes magazines and newspapers were also provided to the students. The students could go to the library or reading room and study these books daily at certain times. Anyhow, this was a brief description of policies and procedures of the boarding school. Let us now talk about the Baba John High School which has a separate description. The high school is separate from the boarding school. They have separate educational grounds, separate dining area, and separate pharmacy. The boarding school has a stone and white cement structure, but the high school had a structure made of tin roofs and a straw-shaped walls. It also has a, has a stone or sand floor. The school rules and regulations were also different. As of Babajan High School had four departments, Farsi, Gujarati, Marathi, and Urdu. English language was also taught in all these departments. It had 14 grades. There were 21 teachers uh, and educators. It had over 100 students. It had at one time a maximum of 125 students and a maximum of 80 students toward the end. The students were from various castes, creeds, religions, and nationality. As it was mentioned earlier, the students would learn up to the seventh grade of metric English plus another language. So anyway, I just uh, don't want to bore you with that. The book is going to come out soon. I mean, it's translated, so it might as well publish it for everyone to read it, I guess. Um, let me see if anybody wants to hear any stories or have any questions. Um, that way maybe we can tackle this a little better. The through the meditation of the heart that the uh, Pastor and Santi and the boys were 
doing. Uh, did it, uh, the experience they were feeling, this love, did it have, um, was it the essence of God and was it different for like a third plane person or a fifth plane person? No, it's the purity of the love that brings one closer to God. And the one who is on the gross conscious plane doesn't have that purity of love because of sanskaras, because of past lives and all that. And the one who had died in the previous life on a third plane of consciousness, he definitely was closer now, uh, coming and seeing Baba at that time. So Baba would you know, give them that experience uh, through meditation of the heart. Now, the way that Baba explained to the boys who were beginners, let me start with that, was to repeat his name. Because the mind is always a tricky thing to quiet. It's not easy to quiet your mind. So uh, Baba would say, okay, repeat my name, it, try to image me within your third eye. You know, when you close your two eyes, what you image, that is called the third eye. And then as they were doing that, then that, that's nothing to do with the meditation of the heart, but, but purifies the soul to the point that one slowly becomes able to image Baba within the heart. Once the soul starts imaging the beloved within the heart, then uh, basically that meditation of the heart starts. And that love becomes purer and purer. And the purity of love brings the soul to the threshold of the beloved, um, uh, you know, in a way that as the soul gets purified, goes through the planes of consciousness, naturally. I mean, planes of consciousness are natural phenomena for the soul to go through. It's nothing out of this space, nothing out of the ordinary. If, some, if someone is on the planes of consciousness, they're never going to talk about it. <coughs> And I tell you why. Um, in a minute, the the thing is that. But as they go through the planes of consciousness, they get different experiences of that plane, as Baba describes also in God speaks. Like, you know, as soon as the soul steps into um, the you know the subtle plane, um, that soul doesn't have a whole lot of interest in the gross plane anymore. The gross plane becomes kind of non-existent. Um, his, his ways of life is all, all relied on the beloved. He basically trusts God completely. He doesn't, you know, get attached to the world and the worldly affairs. And slowly that soul, as it comes through, it starts smelling, you know, beautiful, beautiful fragrance within himself. Starts, you know, hearing melodies within himself, within not the external ears. And sees God inwardly within his heart. And that as becomes further and further in, in, through the path, comes to the third plane of consciousness that the purity of the love becomes really intensified because that is a threshold. The third plane is the threshold of love and miracle. It's, it's kind of intertwined together. One Once goes through the third plane of consciousness into the fourth, the love could become so intensified that through that love, that soul gets infinite power and can destroy universes. And if, it, if that soul doesn't have a master, the shock of that is so much that the soul 
basically it comes back, uh, descends down into uh, rock consciousness. But if the soul has a master, which usually the you know the 50, 56 yeah souls that are on the universe all the time takes care of these things. And they push that soul. They don't let that soul to be too much, too long <coughs> in the fourth plane of consciousness. They push that soul either back into the third plane or push it back into the fifth plane. And that fifth plane is the purity of pure, the purest of the pure, of love. That love becomes so pure that one loses consciousness in that love and doesn't see anything except the beloved and enters into the sixth plane of consciousness. That's why the sixth plane conscious soul can see God with the inner eye constantly. And then the gap between the sixth plane, as Baba explains, to the seventh plane is so much. Although it's so much, with the kick of the beloved, <laughs> that soul jumps and becomes one with the beloved. Yes, ma'am. Yes. soul, if he misbehaves on the fourth plane and kicks back to the rock, is it with human consciousness or he goes back to the rock consciousness? If, it, if, it, if that shock, if it doesn't have a master and the shock of that fourth plane catches him, that is what is called the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. It falls back and becomes, and he has to start from, uh, from rock consciousness, basically. Where are from, you with a, a higher consciousness or back to? Back to, to the very beginning. yep, beginning, beginning. Has to come through the journey again. Mm -hmm. That's his game. Wow. Yeah. So, Sven DR, was on the sixth plane? Isfandiyar was on the sixth plane and, and later at the last of his life, uh, because Baba had promised him that I will show you God and I will, you will see God. Um, he, he, either he passed, I, I can't say that, but I know he was on the sixth plane because the reason I'm saying, is saying that, uh, I mean, he told me uh, indirectly. And I tell you the story of that. Uh, first of all, the fifth plane that he, he, went, he went into, he was on the third plane of consciousness where he was in the Pranayama. I read that in a book, and that's why I didn't know, because I didn't know anything about this. I mean, I, although I grew up with him, he never talked about his, you know, his experiences, never talked about, you know, um, his journey inward. Uh, he, we knew that he was in with Baba in Pranashram. I mean, for me also, I didn't know a whole lot of Pranashram. Uh, a little bit here and there. I've uh, read it in the books. But one, what happened when I came into the United States, um, there was a book, I think it was uh, called uh, Best of Glow, was published. And I read in that that Svandiyar was on the third plane of consciousness when he was in Pramash. Mm. And then I had read God Speaks. I mean, every meeting in Seattle, we would read God Speaks all the time. I love God Speaks. I mean, we would just read it and read it and knew all that. <laughs> and Baba says in God Speaks that any soul on the planes of consciousness can bring other souls to their own level. So, he, reading and hearing that, I went to India. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I didn't go, they pulled me to India because my sister called from Iran in late 89, early 90, that we are going to India and come there and, you know, translate for a standard. I said, okay, I'm coming. Now my, uh, the, the long story, the magic shoes story that a whole lot of people <laughs> probably heard was that I didn't have a good status in America and. But I said, I gotta go. I mean, this is my best opportunity. I gotta go. I mean, it's calm. So I go there, the, you know, as usual, I get with him 
in Dharamsa. He loved to be in Dharamsa because it was, it was in a school. He was a school there. Yeah. So he would sleep there. There was bed there, so he would sleep. At night he would get up and he would wake me up and we would sit both in meditation. Mm -hmm. He was in front of me and I was, you know, across him. So in one night we were meditating together and then it was so blissful. I mean, out of this world, I tell you, out of this world. And uh, in the morning, early morning, I saw him in a blissful mood, you know. And I was blissful myself. So, so I said, this is the best time for me to tell him, you know, to ask him. I said, Amu, Amu means uncle, you know, in Persian. I said, Amu, could you be able to bring me to your own level? Oh, no, this is what I said. I said, <laughs> I said, Amu, I said, Amu, I read that you are on the third plane of consciousness, or you were on the third plane of consciousness, when you were in Pramasham. I don't know what's, you know, what is your level now, but and I read in God Speaks that any soul on any place of consciousness can bring other souls to their own level. So could you bring me to your own level? <laughs> Nothing to lose, right? <laughs> I said, I'm going to ask the question. <laughs> and you know what he did? He put his hand in his pocket. Deep down, he had some pistachios and you know, raisins and all that that he would share with Muhammad sometimes. So he pulled that out and said, it's not like me putting this in your hand. Seriously, it's, it's not like me putting this in your hand. You have to work for it. Then I said, okay, tell me, you know, the work. Then he said, well, I've been telling all along, basically, because, he, you know, he would take our take us when we were kids, uh, every Friday night we would climb the mountains in Iran. And uh, in the mountains there was, I still remember it vividly, there was a turn that on the way back, you know, we were tired and all that, at that turn he would stop and he would say, okay now everybody sit down on the ground uh, on that turn. And it was a beautiful scenery also. He would say, now close your eyes and image Baba within your third eye and repeat his name, repeat his name, repeat his name. Baba, Baba, Baba. And try to keep that image. And then we would go on for a while and then when everybody was kind of getting distracted, he would say, okay, let's go now. So we would come. And, but he wouldn't say, but he was just, you know, giving us that um, that gist of how he worked in Pranational. That was the work. He said, this is how the work is started for all of us in Pranational. And then, uh, then he said, you know what? This is what he told me that year. He said, no, you know what? Now that Baba revealed my identity through you, <laughs> Maybe it's time for me to talk. And then that was his first talk that uh, he started behind that the Ramsar telling us about, you know, the one that I just described, how Baba took him up the hill and told us more about his experience and all that. So he kind of became open. He, he said that, you know, Baba wanted me to share that now because it's going to help other souls also. Mm. And then uh, for the first time he came to America at that time, Peter Booth, who had come to Iran and met him there many times in the, you know, in the, in the meetings, didn't know anything about that either. But he was filming when I was translating that. He didn't know what's going on. He said, can I film? I said, yeah, go ahead and film. So he filmed it. And then he said, gosh, I, I got to get a visa for him to come to America. So he went and after his visa, he got his visa, he came for the first time, we had a, we had a Sahabas in Port Angeles in Seattle at that time, uh, 90, 91, I think it was 91. And uh, he gave a nice talk, uh, I remember he was there, Andy Muir was there, 
um, um, Henry Keshari was there. Yeah, yeah quite a, quite a, you know, um, group was there. Of those who had met Baba, and they talked oh, talked about their experiences and talked about Baba, and he also talked about you know Baba, and that you know kind of started. And he came to Los Angeles. He went back to Iran, and then he came back again. And this time, he, you know, he would continuously visit. He come every year, every six months or so to Myrtle Beach and talk about that. But going back to David's um, question, uh, he explained that he broke his leg, if you remember, he broke his leg. And uh, in one of those nights that he was in the agony and the pain of, you know, uh, of this broken leg and not being able to, you know, be mobilized, and his wife also had broken, I guess, his, her hip. And she was in a bad situation too. And in the middle of the night, her wife gets up and complains that she needs to go to the bathroom. So he calls out to the, their younger son, Parviz. Parviz, come on, get up, take your mother to the bathroom. And Parviz was sound asleep. So he doesn't get up. And, the Spaniard was so agonized that he didn't know what to do. In this agony of this love, he says, I'm going to think about Baba and leave it all to Baba. So he goes to deep meditation on Baba. And that is the heart meditation we are talking about now. And he went into that meditation to such an extent that he said, through that meditation, I lost myself. It wasn't me anymore. It was Baba. It was, it was, it was me. Like first, I felt that I'm in an, you know, infinite ocean of love. But before that, he said that through this love, it came so much power that I uh, strongly felt that I can do anything with this power. But in the meantime, he said, "Well, there was a book on the shelf." I said, "I'm going to see if I can lift that book with a, you know, with my glimpse, basically." <laughs> so he says, you know, he pushes the book, he tries to lift the book, he says, no, I couldn't do that. Now what the master does, he protects you when the, you have the master, and Baba protects him there, because he want, didn't want him to do miracles or, you know, things like that, which is a child play. So he said, when I didn't do that, I said, well, I'm going to use this power. Now he's got infinite power. He said, I'm going to use this power and see if I can love Baba even more. Mm -hmm. And so he goes back into that deep meditation of the heart. And then he tries to love Baba to, to the extent possible. He says, as I was loving to the extent, I lost myself. Then it wasn't me anymore. It was only him. It was only him. And that purity of love, love, Baba brought him back into the, from the fourth plane, because he was stationed in the fourth plane when he was trying to lift the book off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Baba blocks that power, brings him back and pushes him to the fifth plane that he experiences that infinite purity of the love. And then one day, actually, going back to your question, um, you know, we were asking him, he would never reply directly that what uh, plane he is. I remember once even many people asked him, he said, I don't know. He said, I don't know. Um, one, day, one day, we were coming back from a uh, meeting place. He had had a talk at the meeting place. And then I'm following him into their Roba because we were, we were you know, staying at their Roba at that time. And as I'm following him, I don't know what got to me that I started joking around and I started teasing him, saying some funny stuff. And then he turned back, turned his face to me and said, you do not want to fool around with a six-plane saint like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so then I knew that he is on the six-plane. Uh, now, if he was on the six-plane and Baba kicked him off to the sevens, because usually 
if a soul is a section on the sixth brain and drops his body, Baba releases him and becomes one with him. Um, or he became, you know, God realized before he left the body, that I can't tell you. But Shaheen might be able to tell you because he was there at his last <coughs> minutes of his life. Do we have time? Did you love everyone? Um, I have so many things to share, but it's very short time. Um, I want to say that we're just thanking Baba that he trained these boys from Iran and sent them to the Iran to help Iranis. Because all the Baba lovers that now they are in Iran, they are actually come through these boys. Mm. Sandiar, Khosro and other boys, and many, many Baba lovers. They, mm -hmm. they, are, they are disconnected. They, are, they cannot you know, get any other information. So I am myself, I met a Sandiar in Iran a long time ago. And he was my, my teacher, first teacher. But if what Farshid asked me to say, I was, I was living here and I heard that Isfandiyar, actually I was with Isfandiyar in Los Angeles and then he said, I, I want to go back to my hometown and drop my body. This, my time is come. And he was um, repeating one of the Persian Ghazal of Hafez, Hafez uh, will, that he was repeating over and over and over and, and uh, we memorized that Ghazal. Anyway, he went back to Iran, and then um, he was in the Jafarabad in Beidu's house, uh, which is in the, a small village near the Yazd, and um, with Gohar, which is Farshid's sister. And um, Farshid, uh, Gohar was taking care of his family yard, and, um, and somehow Gohar had some work to do, go to he has some urgent work to do, and she has to go to Canada. And she asked me, can you come and stay for a few months, then I can come back because I have to do this kind of urgent work. And I said, sure, I would come. And as a refugee, I came in here in the U.S. as a refugee, so I was kind of with a Persian passport and green card and all that, and I said, wow, I want to go back to Iran. They may uh, trouble me or how I can come back and all that. So I had kind of fear. I mean. But Darwin Shah was there and asked him, Svaniyar is in Iran, should I go and be at Svaniyar? Darwin Shah said, yes, go. So I went back to Iran and I stayed in the same house with Svaniyar and her Gohar and Gohar left and she, she, she told me what to do. So I was cooking with him with, 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 for Svaniyar and for, for others and then uh, be a watchman at night time. And um, so he was, very, he was very happy in the beginning. He was enjoying the meal and all that. Uh, was at night, um, gradually, gradually, I knew that his time is coming. It's my dream and I feel it. And then uh, one night he didn't, Came, he, used, he used to come to the kitchen and eat with us. And he was so strong. He was just, he has a walker. He was throwing his walker and walking. He was so strong as a... Uh, I was surprised to see him. And then he came and um, one, one day he didn't come to the kitchen. And I asked him, please come. I beg him. I try to, you know, you know, bring him. And he didn't come. And people around the families or friends or neighbors would uh, suspiciously come and say, what you are doing, you are not a doctor, you are not a nurse, what you are doing, you would, you would kill him. Take him to the hospital. I said, he doesn't want to go to the hospital. I know he doesn't want to go to the hospital. And what they can do for him, he would suffer in hospital. And so I asked uh, his son to come and see his father because I knew he's going to go. So he was with us. And then uh, Farshid's father, also Khudadat, was also there all the time. He was farming, helping, and all that. And um, 
one day, um, so I was trying to bring him some juice or soup or something, and uh, he he didn't want to eat solid food or, or just juice or soup. And then um, one day, he sat all night and all day on his bed, sitting like that and closing his eyes. And I felt, uh, I said to myself, how he can do that? How one person can sit like that for 24 hours? And I tried to take him, and I didn't want to disturb actually. When he was doing that kind of work, I never disturbed. I was just watching whatever he called me because I was doing, I was with him for a long time, and so I learned about him. I was sitting next to his bed and I said to myself, I cannot do what he can do. I cannot love Meher Baba like he does. Over all these years being with his family, I can't do that. How I can love Meher Baba? And I knew his family would read my mind. I was like a naked person in front of him. He knew what I did, or what going to happen, everything was open. Mm -hmm. I knew all that it happened. And uh, he started uh, repeating Baba's name with some kind of sweet tune, like a melody. And then I realized, if I cannot love Meher Baba, at least I can re repeat his name. If I cannot deeply love, it's like it's finally, I can re repeat his name, that much I can. So I started repeating with Svanya, and the Svanya started clapping. <laughs> and I realized he's encouraging me as, as, a, as a beginner to just repeat what was there. And uh, then gradually, gradually, he was sitting for a long time. I was, he didn't like the diapers, so he was uh, having kind of things. And so I was changing the sheets yeah. and things like that. Okay. And then um, one day uh, he was I, so he was so weak now he could he didn't eat for uh, two months mm. so he was kind of only juice and soup things like that. And he was so weak so he couldn't he couldn't grab the spoon eat by himself so I got uh, I, I got the idea to go into the town and get the baby bottles <coughs> so I pour uh, soup and juice in the baby bottle and open the head a little bit bigger mm. and so I give it to him and he was he appreciated he appreciated so much he he showed me he's, he's enjoying it. he was like a baby you know <laughs> suckling that the bottle. And I loved it that much that he, he appreciated for what I did. I mean, and um, it was uh, noon time, and um, Khudadad was with his family or feeding him or something. And then I was in the kitchen and usually cook for everyone. Uh, very simple food. Um, and then um, all of a sudden, the radio, a Persian radio was on and was reciting Quran. Because every day they call call out for a go to the mosque or pray. It was noontime and was for time for pray. So start singing and calling. All of a sudden, Khudadad said, "Come, come!" The Sandhya is not breathing anymore. So I came to him, his body. He, he was gone. Ah. But he he told me before that he said, "I'm not going to come." I said, I will see you. I said, I knew he's going to go. I said, I will see you again. He said, no, I'm not going to come back. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so we took his body to the cemetery, Persian, so, I mean, Zoroastrian cemetery in, um, in Yazd. Actually, you would see the Tower of Silence. It's become like a historic period place, Tower of Silence, they don't, Zoroastrian, they don't put any more body on the Tower of Silence for birds to come. And then um, other people become kind of nervous because some people, they was against the Baba, mm. very deadly against the Baba, and they didn't even allow us, uh, allow us to take his Sandhya's body to the cemetery. Mm. And some of the miracle happened, they, they didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. We took his body to a cemetery. 
And the guy who was, he was washing the body, he was there. He was an old guy. So, you know. And I was with this man here, I says, he said, are you related to him? I said, yes, he says, he's my father. He says, come, come. Can you help me? I said, yes, of course I can. So I went inside and um, he took his clothes off and uh, he said, uh, help me with washing. And I saw his body again and I was, and I, I, I felt, I remember what this man here said before as a joke because we, I used to take him to the bath and give him a shower and all that. He says, a human body needs a one, twice bath, one day born and one day die. <laughs> and then, and then I realized this is the last, last bath for him. So we washed his body and uh, we took him to the ready and put it in the grave. And uh, Farshid's father, Khudadad, he was a very fiery man. He was a, and he, he stand up and he started um, reciting Baba's prayers. And some of the some of the Babada were also they were become like kind of nervous, you know. We are talking about Baba in front of the public and they may say, Why you are doing this and things like that. But he did that. And then we recite per Hafez for will also that he was repeating all the time. And then uh, that was it. He, he uh, but one thing I want to just finish my uh, one thing I I learn I know is time is tight. Just one more two minutes um, about the dill and about the fire. I mean heart. As a Zoroastrian, I was a ch I was a child. My parents would take me to the fire temple, and I was uh, watching Zoroastrian praying in front of fire. And I said, Why we are praying in front of fire? And Zoroaster says, without this fire, you should, you should uh, in front of fire pray. And um, so Zor the, the Zoroastrian or the uh, priest burning the fire all the time, 24 hours, 7 days a week, all the time. Even they took the fire to the India. Mm -hmm. And I said, why we pray in, in front of fire? What that means? What that metaphor? Well, there is something should be. I, don't, I can't get it. And the priest would, the teacher would say, oh, fire is holy, without the fire you cannot live, or fire is cleansing and all that. I said, I have, and also Muslim would tell us we are a fire worshiper. Mm -hmm. I said, we are not a fire worshiper, we pray, you know, pray Ahura Mazda. Which is cool. And then later, the Spanish explained to me, and I read Baba's books, and then I realized what that means, the fire. That is affect all my life, and I realize actually Swami also always uses stories and uh, poems, which is as a metaphor. I always stay with the children and with the people as a as a poem. The metaphor always makes sense and stay in our mind. And then uh, the fire, he said, when Zoroaster brought the fire, it was it was symbol of love for God. And our heart is a temple. And that fire should be burned all the time in our heart. Mm. And that fire, without that love or without that fire, no matter what we pray or you know do, there is no meaning. There is nothing. It's just ritual. So whatever we do, if we have we have love for it, it would be some meaning. So Spandiar said that. And then I realized he was trying to tell us, don't love my Baba with your mind, with your heart. Mm -hmm. And that is the, that's the fire of love should burn all the time in your heart. And eventually one day, you become one with fire, that fire. Uh, there is another story, it's very short, that I was in Los Angeles also, related to that, that story. Maybe leave it for some of the time because I know oh, okay. these guys are... Oh, no. Does no, no, everybody want to hear it? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> the jar already rolls. <laughs> and uh, this is, I'm trying to just finish up. So the, another story was uh, when I was in uh, California, Los Angeles, with, in Shirin's house with the Swan Dior. At night time we were sharing a bedroom 
with his friend Yar, and I was helping him to take him to the bathroom or things like that. And uh, nighttime, I was working during the day, and so nighttime I was trying to just you have a rest. But the Spaniel was singing, and, <laughs> and I was saying, oh my god. And then <laughs> and early morning he would come at like a 5 o'clock, and he was sitting on his sofa and asked me to come and sit with him and meditate. I said, oh, I, I can't do it. And then um, I was... I was, you know, I was very stupid. I didn't even know <laughs> what he was trying to do. And I, anyway, I many times I regret what I did. But anyway, I, I was so fortunate being with him at, at least. So anyway, one night I, uh, I was with him, and all of a sudden he was crying. And I said, Why is crying? I should cry because I don't have anything. I don't love my Baba. I'm not. I'm nothing, but he is so close. He loves Baba so much. When he he met Baba. He was in the school. He's finished. Why is he crying? And I said, um, I was just thinking like that. I didn't say anything. And he started singing that poems that uh, Sadi uh, said. Uh, I don't know, Sadi or more Rumi is one of the Persian poets. شب یاد دارم که چشمم نخوف شنیدم که پروانه باشم گفت که من عاشقم گر به سوزم رواز تو را گریه و سوز باری چراست It's a ghost right now And the roughly translation is uh, Isfandi are trying to tell me He said, uh, the translation says a conversation between moth and candle mm -hmm. Moth says, I'm a lover to the, to the candle Why are you crying? Why are you burning and crying? And Candle said, I'm crying because they made me with the beeswax. Mm -hmm. They took honey away from me. I'm crying for sweetness, for honey. Mm -hmm. He's, it's away from me. And he said, the Candle said to Moth, you are not a true lover. You are afraid of burning. Of you come close to the fire, but you run away. Look at me, I'm burning from head to toe. Mm -hmm. And give the light and love and to others. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw him as a candle, which he was burning and give a light mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is. And then he was telling me, "You are not a true lover. You are afraid. You are afraid of burning." Mm -hmm. And eventually, eventually, this is a metaphor. Eventually, one day, the moth. Embrace the fire and become one with fire. That's mm. the metaphor. Mm. <laughs>